We are really pleased to have Anthony, Anthony Hudson, Carla Rossi with us this evening. I'm gonna read a little bio from um, uh, Anthony's website. So Anthony Hudson, uh, Grand Ronde, is a multidisciplinary artist, writer, performer, and filmmaker. Anthony lives in Portland, among the lush greenery, sprawling gentrification, and a not mutually exclusive fear of bridges and earthquakes. Anthony is perhaps best known as Portland's premier drag, cl drag clown, Carla Rossi, an immortal trickster whose attempts at realness almost always result in fantastic failure. Anthony and Carla have been featured at Seattle's Pride Fest, the Risk Reward Festival, Pepper Pepper's Critical Mascara for TBA at PICA, the Cascade AIDS Project Art Auction, and Conduit Dance, Dances Dance and Festival, along with hosting a veritable buffet of monthly nightlife events where she, he has performed alongside drag legends like Coco Peru, Christine, Lady Bunny, Peaches uh, Christ, and many more. Uh, Anthony and Carla host a program uh, called Queer Horror, an ongoing exclusively LGBTQ horror screening series in the country at the Hollywood Theater. And Anthony recently took a job at the Hollywood as community programmer. In 2018, um, Anthony was awarded a Native Arts and Culture Foundation's National Artist Fellow um, in Artistic Innovation, which is a great honor. Congratulations. Um, and also has a radio show on uh, X-Ray FM. So lots of ways to connect with your work. Um, and is a graduate of PNCA from 2013. So I will hand it over to Carla Rossi. What doesn't she do? Sleep, that's the answer. <laughs> now pretend that, pretend, everyone close your eyes, close your eyes, go with me on a journey. We're gonna have a guided meditative sesh real quick. Close your eyes, imagine your first memory. It doesn't have to be your first, just imagine it. You can make it up, all your memories are fake anyway. I hope your eyes are closed. Oh thank God, you're not charlatans. Keep them closed. Now take a deep breath. And exhale. Now think of your favorite color. Mine's white. Take another deep breath. And exhale. And now on the count of three, I want you to open your eyes, but not until the count of three. And I want you to pretend that we're in a theater and that you've never seen me sitting here and that a thing is about to start. One, two, and three. Oh, yeah. 
Does anyone have a light? Anyone? No one? Wrong crowd, maybe. (laughs) Wrong crowd, wrong happening. That's the problem with being painted the girl with the cigarette. You have one. You just never get to smoke it. (laughs) Hmm. I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> it's just that <sighs> this feels insincere, this setup. I tried. <laughs> it doesn't really feel like it's taking, at least for me. It feels like there's a layer of artifice, or two, or three. I don't know, I lost count. I was asked to do this talk, and I thought, <gasps> oh my god, the art museum? Yes! Obviously, yes. Sign me up. Call my agent. Book me. I'll do it. I would be honored to be here at the Portland Art Museum talking about artwork like an artist, like someone who knows what they're talking about. So, I had this whole thing planned. I was going to be Carla because that's the one everyone knows. (laughs) And I was going to give a monologue as this painting. This is one of my favorite pieces in the museum. And, And I respect it. I mean... I respect the Mona Lisa. I think we all respect the Mona Lisa because you'd be an asshole if you didn't. Um, but I don't get it completely with the Mona Lisa. Like, what's so special about... <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't completely get it. But with this painting, with Girl with a Cigarette, I get that. I get the Mona Lisa air here because this is the one I always am drawn to every time I walk up just to this part of the museum. This is the only part I look at, and then I leave, and I say, good day, bill me. (laughs) Um, Thank you. Yeah, she's it. So, (laughs) I had this whole thing planned that I was just going to ramble as her, that I was going to speak for her. I was going to bring her to life. I thought, like, maybe I shouldn't just be Carla. Maybe I should paint myself like a painting and do it, and, like, do that whole, like, 3D Salma Hayek and Frida thing, but without Harvey Weinstein telling me what to do. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe I'll do that. I'll make it happen. I'll sell it, and it will work, and it will be really exciting. And, and the whole time, I can contextualize the exact place that she came from, that she came from, because all good art comes with footnotes, does it not? It doesn't. <laughs> so in my original script, which I threw away uh, literally last night, I had a couple drunk nights just writing, writing, what would she have to say? And, and I, I, I looked at it, and it just it felt wrong. So I, I threw it out. I wrote something completely new. I'm going to be reading on and off today. I'm really sorry about that. But it's the life of a working artist, is it not? So in my original script, I was saying stuff like this. Just imagine. The year, 1968. The place... America, imagine if you can, a turbulent era, racial strife, students shot, politicians and preachers gunned down, a man with a black bag on his head starts shooting up San Francisco, they call him the Zodiac Killer, and he might be Ted Cruz. Meanwhile, a war rages on in the jungle, and you can watch it all on TV. I'll never forget the day, that subtle day in 1968. I was preparing my rice-a-roni when I heard Robert Kennedy had been shot. The milkman delivered the news to me. 
They say don't shoot the messenger. In this case, I shot the milk. Ding, ding, indeed. Are you sure no one's got a light? So I feel kind of good that I'm not doing that tonight. <laughs> but that really was the original plan. So what is there to say about the girl with the cigarette? Moses Sawyer painted her, like Carla already addressed, in 1968. Moses Sawyer was a social realist painter born in Russia in 1899. He immigrated with his family to the United States in 1912. He died in the Chelsea Hotel in 1974 while painting a choreographer. The only way to go out, honestly. <laughs> Thanks, Wikipedia, by the way, for all that information. <laughs> There's a plaque behind me, but I, I trust uh, websites written by 13-year-olds more. <laughs> Curatorial science, you understand. I do like what this plaque has to say, though. Reflective and distant, the young woman seems to capture some of the angst of a turbulent era. Hmm. I'm always entertained by my museum plaques. You know what they say? Those who can, paint. Those who can't, write plaques. And those who can't smoke, get trapped inside paintings. <laughs> I'm kind of obsessed with the era of this painting. I smoked a lot of weed as a teenager and listened to a lot of classic rock in back rooms growing up. And my dad and my uncle were in Vietnam and, and I've always felt connected to the 1960s. Part of it's my dad's acid stories, like when he saw his uh, commanding officer turn into Porky Pig on the Navy boat. Another part might be my tragically contemporary fondness for cults. And that time the Beach Boys were hanging with the Mansons and trying to figure out how to one-up the Beatles. That was a special moment in time, I like to think. A dark triangle of folk music. All of those people back then, they were all on drugs. And just the other day, I was explaining to my husband, and yes, I do know Jason, that is an incredibly strong word. I was explaining to him that <laughs> The fall of the 60s and, and Weimar Germany, you know, the golden 20s, which I recounted in my show, Carla Rossi Sings the End of the World. Those are the two eras I really wish that I belonged to. They were turbulent times, you know, times of, of great forward thinking liberalism and, and art and, and freedom and subsequent collapse, and descent into conservatism and fascism. It was the time of promise before the rise of Hitler and those burnouts who had to live under the nose of Nixon. I sometimes think about where we are now, or even where we were with Obama just two years ago. But what we didn't and what we don't have and what those eras did have, it's the music and the fashion, right? They're made of legend. Dionne Warwick, everyone. And the girl with a cigarette? She's one of those legends. With this painting in particular, I can't stop thinking about an essay my professor, Sarah Santillis, had us read in undergrad. It was W.J.T. Mitchell's What Do Images Want? And it literally asks that question. What do pictures want from us? What is it asking for? And what do we do with her request? I always thought that essay was poetic, but bullshit. Like most things you read in college. A picture doesn't want anything. A picture I sound like a Minnesotan kindergarten teacher. A picture. <laughs> a picture doesn't want or need anything because it isn't alive. And as a matter of fact, last time I checked, painting was dead, right, Jason? He's a painter, so we make jokes about that all the time at home. It's okay to laugh. 
Regardless, or as some people deliciously say, irregardless, I find myself thinking all the time about Mitchell's stoner essay all over again and again with this piece in particular. Obviously, a painting doesn't want anything, right? It's just a substrate and material, a medium. Oil, water, time. But I suddenly find myself wondering, what would this painting want? Does she want to know the world around her? Does she want to know the world outside her, outside this hallway? Does she want a change of scenery? Or is she, as I said in my original script, sick as shit of the view? <laughs> no offense to the rest of the pieces in the American wing here. <laughs> Except that surly piece that looks like Cinderella's stepmother over there with the bouffant and the blue dress. You can hear her right now. Cinderella! <laughs> You're not going to the ball. Back to the girl with a cigarette. How does she feel about being painted by a man? And how do I feel living in a body that people often look at or encounter or label as a man's? Doing drag, doing an art form that most people don't look at as an art form. Taking on and wearing another gender, wearing her, essentially. How do I feel about that in relation to her? I feel kind of insincere, hence the opening of the show that never actually happened. I think it's terrible enough that straight women have to date straight men. <laughs> My poor housemate, you guys. But honestly, imagine being painted by one. That's all you'd ever be. It's your Eve drawn from Adam's rib. I guess that's one comfort for her. For all this painting's angst about a turbulent era and her identity, we're just as out of the know as she is. And somehow, we're still living through the exact same problems. In a strange twist today, Nazis are closer to our time than they are to hers. Who saw that one coming? But all the other socio-political ailments are there. Abortion, desegregation, slavery, look at the prison system, sexual liberation, gender liberation, anti-fascism, profound ignorance, and relentless violence. The war isn't on your TV set anymore, man. The war is your TV set, man. And honestly, how infuriating that we just repeat these cycles over and over because that's the mark of being human. So how does she feel about being a gift, a gift of Mr. and Mrs. Charles Muhlenberg. How would you feel about that? Honestly, once again, I don't know, but I really doubt Charles was Mrs. Muhlenberg's real name. This one's for you, Mrs. Muhlenberg. You don't know. Just one of your many toys You don't own me Don't say I can't go with other boys And don't tell me what to do Don't tell me what to say And please, when I go out with you Don't put me on display change me in any way you don't own me don't tie me down cause 
I really do feel bad that she can't smoke that cigarette, though. Honestly, I do. I wonder, does she feel she's at a disadvantage? That we get to come and, and go and, and know what's happening outside, just like all of you did today? Does she know what came before her, and can she dream about what will come after? What came after? And does she want to know, or would it break her? Does she long to walk in our world and, and out of the angst of a turbulent era, out of the angst of her turbulent era? Does she want to trade that angst for comfort, to be equal and, and free, to be more than a housewife or a harlot or a wall hanging? I wonder if she wants to trade us right here and now, to take our clothes and our skin and give us her oils, melting them straight onto our spirit with a hairdryer or however you're supposed to melt a painting onto a ghost. Would she sacrifice herself to be free from stasis? If she can't light the cigarette, would she ask to be lit herself and put to an end? And is that it? Is stasis really what we're all dealing with right now? Earlier, I said I was tired of repetition, of the cycles of history. But I think my frustration also comes from stasis. That we're not moving because a bully is standing in the way of the car we're trying to drive. Are we just as trapped in time as she is? Does she want to know if she gained the right to her own body, which a man painted? Does she know if women won the right to choose? And by the way, did women win the right to choose? Because it's 40 years later and I feel like we're still out for a verdict. And still, on the verge of collapse and annihilation, whether nuclear or, or with an assault rifle, that's the world we live in, just like hers. But until that collapse or that annihilation, I'll look at the girl with a cigarette and I'll think of those women of the era who felt the angst of a turbulent time. Of Judy Garland, who would die one year after this painting's completion of Aretha Franklin, whose Say a Little Prayer was released in 1968 and who died today. May she rest in power. Of Sharon Tate, who was a year from the end in 68, and Janis Joplin, who had two left to go. Of Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who were to throw bricks and bottles at cops one year later in Stonewall. Of Coretta Scott King, who was told over the phone in 68 that her husband had been shot. Of Jackie, who would finally gain her O that year with Aristotle Onassis. And of Dusty Spring Springfield. But I like to just call her Dusty. Who made a name for herself singing love songs to men even though she was a lesbian. Son of a Preacher Man debuted in 1968, and Dusty's star was set in stone. Like the best of us, she lived a life battling substance abuse and depression. A woman fierce in creativity and held down by an industry that fed off of her. 
not a woman, but an object manipulated, and never asked, just like this image, what it is she wants. And still, Dusty sw sings sweetly to someone she can never love, just like in her recording of a song also made famous by another wonderful, doomed chanteuse named Karen. Why do birds suddenly appear every time you are near? Just like me, they long to be close to you. Why do stars fall down from the sky every time? Decided to create a dream come true So they sprinkle moon dust in your hair of gold And starlight in your eyes of blue That is why all the girls in town Follow you all around Just like Thank you. I would love to, um, thank you all so much. I would love to happily take questions or comments or thoughts or we can further investigate what, she, what it is that the girl with a cigarette wants. Um, if anyone has anything to share, now is the time. Aretha Franklin was in it from the beginning. Um, so, what, three days ago. <laughs> Artists, right? Yeah, Aretha, Aretha was in it from the, the very start. Um, originally, I had Aretha happening at the very end. Uh, and I actually opened with Dionne Warwick's Walk On By, um, which is one of my favorite, just beautiful, soulful, depressing songs to put on, like most of these songs. Um, because I liked the idea of her, I, was, I wanted to be standing in the mirror as her, fixing my hair, looking in the actual mirror, listening to walk on by, imagining her life where people just walk on by. Um, and that just felt dumb. So I ended up not doing that. Uh, and, and I thought, well, what if I put Aretha in the beginning? Because I, I really love that song so much. I love Aretha. Um, today's news is very sad. Um, but I, I thought, what if I put her in the beginning? And, and it's, a, it's a drag number that I love. I love that song. And it's, if you ever watch Glee, there's a really cute dance number that they put together for it that I stole like one move from because I'm not coordinated. So yeah, Aretha's been in it from the very beginning. Uh, and, and then it felt strange 
with what happened. It, it was a little more emotional to bring her into this. Um, it's a great song, and she was an amazing human being, and the world's going to be different without her. Absolutely. I 100% it had to be this painting. Um, originally, when I was talking with Stephanie, like I, I was like, well, maybe I'll do a walking tour and, and I'll take the people around and we could look at the Kahinde Wiley or we could look at the native wing sponsored by the Confederate tribes of Grand Ronde. Thanks, peeps. <laughs> That's my, my tribe. Uh, so, so I was like, maybe I should do something like that. Um, and Stephanie was like, you dumb clown. We've got cameras and equipment. <laughs> So uh, that actually was great because this was all I wanted to do regardless. I felt like I would just have to fill more time and, and I don't know. But, but I really just wanted to just focus on her. So to actually hear like, oh, let's just pick maybe one stationary area. Um, and then I, I obviously I knew it had to be her. Like I, I said in the beginning, this is the piece I always come to in the museum. Um, I, uh, I do like art, I swear. I, I love other art pieces. Um, I, I often enjoy art for someone who went to art school. That's rare to find. Uh, but, but this piece, honestly, like, I mean, they say painting's dead, but you look at her and she's completely alive. So, yeah, she's my fave. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited. I want to be done for Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I absolutely. From the beginning, I thought I'm going to be her. I'm going to thank you for looping in the rest of your question that I didn't answer to. People, people always are like, "Oh, the artist said it. And now that's all that we'll ever hear." I guess um, the artist. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely had to be her uh, because because I'm doing drag, and I thought, why not? This is my really. I mean, I can't do this on Halloween. Unless if I, I mean, I could, and I could walk around with a frame, and, and I, could, I could try, I could, I could say I deserve to win every costume contest, but I would lose all of them, uh, because no one, not enough of the right people would get the reference. Um, or the right people would, but not enough people would, because that's the problem with our world, there's not enough right people. <laughs> that, that sounds horrible. On my radio show the other day, I found myself advocating for um, limiting how many children people could have, and I was like, wait a second, Carla, your, your people were sterilized by the government until the 70s. Do you want to be advocating for that, you stupid clown? So, um, yeah, I, 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 the problem, though, was I, I had this whole thing where it, when I was asked to do this, I thought, I'm going to be her, I'm going to dress up as her, it's going to be Carla. Um, and then as I wrote, I, I wrote this whole script as her, um, where she literally was just, it was like... <laughs> I was Sandra Bernharding it, you know? And I was just like, oh, back in the 60s. <laughs> I wish I knew what happened outside these walls. Um, but, but it just felt so insincere. And like I said in the beginning, that was, that was a real moment. It, didn't, it felt fake and it felt forced. And last night, poor Jason had to deal with me on the couch at, at 11 at night being like, I keep rehearsing this. <laughs> keep rehearsing this. I keep looking at the script pages <laughs> and and it's just not working. And I, I feel like I put myself in a position by saying Carla will be there and people will pay money and they will show up expecting a clown and I don't think the clown is right for this. Um, because Carla isn't smart. Carla isn't sincere. Uh, she doesn't know how to read and I had to do that today. <laughs> um, and so I actually, up until like... Uh, this morning, I wasn't comfortable with the idea of, I almost came as just myself just to read what I wrote about her, but I thought, no, I actually, I still want to open it as her and, and get that moment because that is the Halloween costume I'll never get to have. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that, that that was worth it for some people because, I, yeah, I just idolize her if that's not apparent. Your outfit is spot on for the painting. How long did it take you to put that together? I walked into Ray's Ragtime yesterday. I keep making procrastination jokes, but they're funny because they're true. 
I walked into Ray's Ragtime yesterday. I work at the Hollywood, as Stephanie mentioned in my bio. And I, I said, I'm going to go take a meeting. And I walked down, and I went into Ray's Ragtime. And I said, Ray, help. <laughs> and I, I brought up the picture on my phone, and I showed it to him. And he's like, well, what, what kind of, th are you shaving? <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I'm going to be doing it as like a clown who's evil. Anyway, um, Ray found me the skirt, he found me the slip, and then I couldn't find a work shirt, so this morning I ran down to Goodwill, and I was like, I was like, maybe I'll go with this brown. It's suggestive of something between mustard and khaki. Um, and Jason actually found it. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm really happy with uh, how it turned out. I mean, this is a size 29 vintage skirt that I don't fit into, so it is safety pinned together. Um, and, and everything in front of you is a lie, obviously. <laughs> but, but a happy lie that I'm, I'm glad translates. So thank you very much. Um, go to Ray's Ragtime, everyone. They're wonderful. The only place to shop. Hey. Yeah, I don't have a question. Uh, Those are my favorite kinds to answer. <laughs> Several times I felt like crying just seeing how, like, I come to the museum and I'm a magnet to this. I never really thought about it yeah, the feeling for myself, but for me, what you did today was sort of expand my compassion for most of humanity because it <laughs> says so much. And then it's sort of like with all of everything that's going on, you could just like scream and yell and whatever happens in the world is like And she can't even smoke it. It's so sad. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. That means a lot to me. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that Mitchell essay. I, I, it was so much. It was so funny how much I found myself fighting that essay. It, it's called "What Do Images Want?" I mentioned it. Um, it's by W. J. T. Mitchell, who wrote like "The Medium Is the Message" and and all these you know criti art critical media texts, exploring videotapes. Um, and w I, w I was in an ethics and aesthetics class, and Sarah Santilli's, if, if, if people don't know Sarah Santilli, she was my college mentor. Um, she just wrote this amazing book called Draw Your Weapons. Uh, she is one of the world's foremost experts on torture and religious violence. And, um, uh, and she's a feminist theologian who went to Harvard to be a doctor, or to be a priest, and she she saw the Abu Ghraib photographs and she thought, oh, never mind, I need to write about something else. Um, and her book, Draw Your Weapons, asked this question of like, what, what is the point of making work in a time of war or like in a time like this? What is the point of making art of being creative? And I have that question all the time. My show in November is kind of about that. Um, and what Sarah really says is that any act of creation, of making art, of uh, you're remaking the world and you're, you're the words that you use, the way you encounter people, the way you think about them, the way you talk, the way you look and summon at another and say, you, I, uh, that's all how we make the world and it's all how we see it. And how we see the world really affects the world that we do exist in, if this makes sense, instead of talking in a circle. Um, and, and so I was really taken by all the, all the things that I learned in Sarah's classes and, at PNCA. Um, it was one of the most amazing and influential and compassionate and, and, and things that I've encountered that I'm so grateful for. Uh, but in her class with that Mitchell essay, I was just like, Sarah, I love everything that you're talking about, but this essay is bullshit. Paintings don't have feelings. Uh, and I've always thought that essay was wackadoodle. I always thought Mitchell was a little wackadoodle because of that essay. But then when I was thinking about her, I literally, I could not stop thinking about that essay, and I could not stop thinking about what she wants, because for me, and especially thinking about all the women that I list, um, something you might not know about, I worship women, um, I idolize women, it's what, part of why I do drag, it's, it's trying to summon the power that I saw from the women in my life growing up. Um, that's one of the many reasons. And yeah, I, I, I just always felt like that essay, it, it was just bananas, but but to be able to, to think about what would she really want, what, and what, what, is, what does she signify in the story of all these other women who came before and the battles that they fought, and how would they feel to know that where their battles are at today? 
and I'm sure there's many women and probably women here that can testify to that and what that experience is like. Um, and yeah, it just, it makes me think. It makes me sad, but it also makes me hopeful. And yeah, I don't know where, where else to go with that. I'm really glad that you mentioned the women in your life because I could feel throughout the whole talk all the honor that you're giving to women. And I was thinking, I wish my daughter, almost five-year-old daughter, and I was wishing that she was here because she would be so in love with your face and you and just so excited. And I wanted to ask you, like, I mean, and also that thing you did with go back to your earliest memory, it doesn't matter what it was because they're all made up anyway. It's really free way to start a meditation, so I'm going to use that. <laughs> um, but also, just wondering, like, taking yourself back to your five-year-old self, like, what, um, how did you build to be so free and strong? <laughs> <laughs> well, a little gasoline <laughs> and a lot of luck. Um, how, yeah, that's a great question. So when I was a little kid, <laughs> don't talk about your play, Carla. <laughs> when I was a little kid, I would sit in front of my TV and watch Peter Pan, the Mary Martin musical um, from 1960. And I would watch, I would trade off between Peter Pan and Beetlejuice every single, all day, every single day until the TV turned green. Um, and then I kept watching it. I just watched Beetlejuice with extra green glow to the, to the picture. And honestly, I kind of, uh, I, I was sort of raising, I sort of raised myself. Um, my, I love my parents so much. They're my favorite people. Uh, but, you know, my mom spent most of her time dealing with her own stuff in her life. And my dad was just kind of off avoiding that. Um, and so I just sort of raised myself watching these movies over and over, all day, every day. And I, I was a weird, queer, fat kid. I, did, I lived in a small town. Um, I didn't want to grow up. That's why I was obsessed with Peter Pan. And, and yeah, I, I created this world, this imaginative world, where I, could, I, would, I would hold on to my stuffed animals, and I remember going inside the TV and, like, going into Neverland. Um, and I... I, I I, I, that's the one thing, as I got older, I always regretted and I missed so much that loss of being able to instantly flip a switch and you're somewhere else. Like when you're a kid playing uh, at recess and you're like, we're playing hot lava monster, stay off the big toy, that's hot lava, <laughs> you know? And it becomes real for kids. They, uh, they can augment their reality. Like the kids are the original virtual reality in their heads. Um, and, and so I really lived in that world. I was withdrawn, and I just entertained myself. And I, but I didn't feel alone. I was really happy when I was with myself, because <laughs> I'm a narcissist, I guess. Um, but as I got older, then uh, I, I, I still had all that, that imagination and all of that, but it wasn't as e easy to access. And I felt the sense of turning, growing up and turning into this, this person who I was told God would hate me for being, or, or I was suddenly understanding myself as a mixed race person in a very white town, and I didn't know how to convey to other people that I am someone different. Um, and I, 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 w I had this thing inside me that I really wanted to get out, but I never knew how. And I just, I tried living a normal life. Um, I tried working at the mall. I tried moving up to Portland to go to art school and I was gonna be an illustrator and be humble and quiet. Uh, and then I met some drag queens and um, my life fell apart in, in the best way. And I started doing this and everything, everything that I had dreamed about or imagined, the, the voices I did, the plays I put on in my head, the radio dramas that I would record on my computer and add sound effects to, they all were able to not just be this thing that I kept inside myself and I was able to bring them out and use them as, as a way to, to make art and to talk about everything that I had been kind of suppressing in my life. Um, and ever since then, it's been a, a huge place of power for me. I'm really grateful for uh, the, the fact that people are also entertained and enjoy the things that I do because I do it all for myself. Um, I spent a long time j just trying to, especially as I was figuring out my, my my path as an artist. <laughs> like, I, I, um, I would try to do things that I thought people would want to see. And a big part of that was art school, because you do critiques, and, and no one gets it when you do this in art school. And they're like, have you tried blue? <laughs> um, and I, that, that would be what the professor says. That would be the head of the department. Isn't that right, Jason? I thought you just nod your head in terror every time I <laughs> beckon to you. 
<laughs> we're not like this at home. Um, and uh, yeah, so so being able to just take this thing and 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 and, and use it to to express everything has been so empowering. And I think for me, that's why I love doing drag workshops with children. I love kids coming to my shows. Um, I, I honestly, I love adults, and I'm so grateful that you all are here, but I would drop you all in a second for an audience of kids. Um, I really, I honestly would. Uh, ki I didn't realize until like two or three years ago when people actually started, I guess I had enough of a name for myself that people trusted me to, to come in and talk to their kids about gender and drag and all that. Um, ever since I started doing that kind of work, it's changed my life. And that actually, I, I said I was hopeless in the show, and I, I, in the sense of the cycles of repetition and history and, and the hopelessness of everything. Um, <laughs> but, but when I do those workshops and I ask those kids, I talk to the kids about what drag is and how drag isn't just dressing as a woman. Drag is, is liberating your sexuality and your expression and being able to play like you were a kid again. Um, when I, when I show them like these kind of diagrams and we work through the fact that all of this stuff is constructed and invented and can be walked into and performed, um, I ask the kids, okay, so we've looked at what drag is, now what's gender? And the kids always say, it's not real! <laughs> and it gives me so much hope, because I'm just like, oh, man, I really hope we don't destroy the planet before they can, <laughs> before they can like kind of save it for us. And that's what I also say at the end of all my workshops. It's like, okay, kids, now, no, uh, don't stress, but you have to fix everything for us. So <laughs> have fun. <laughs> Love you. Mean it. <laughs> Please take care of me when I'm old. <laughs> so, yeah. That was a very long-winded answer for thank you. Are there any other questions? I think we still have a, a, like, a minute or two. If anyone had anything else. Hey, Stephanie. What am I not working on right now? Um, my life. <laughs> Sleep. Yeah. So uh, uh, there's a couple things. Um, I'm very excited. I, 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 we just did, thanks to Luann here, my, my dramaturg, who I've been working with for the last two years at Artist Repertory Theater through the Table Room Stage program. Um, I have been working on a, a full play version. It's, it's sort of a play. It's a, weird, it's a weird collection of my brain exploding out into the stage with, with six actors. We'll call that a play. Um, and <laughs> it's a play version of my show, Looking for Tiger Lily, which was about me being a five-year-old growing up watching Peter Pan on the TV and seeing Tiger Lily played by Sandra Lee, who is a white woman with blonde hair and blue eyes and pigtails. And I love her in that role. Um, but she plays one of the Neverland natives. And it, it was this great sense of schism that, that installed in me as a kid and, and that sense of double consciousness and skewed identity. Um, being a little Indian kid who looks white, but watching her and I look like her. Um, so the show is about that. <laughs> it's a play. Uh, it's, it's where I decide to become a native artist and Carla actually, uh, I, I stop performing as Carla and Carla breaks free from me and she just decides to, to one-up me every step of the way as I try to prove myself as an artist who doesn't need this clown anymore. Um, and it's 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 crazy time. We spent a week rehearsing it in a studio and workshopping it, and then we just did uh, two staged readings for Proscenium Live. Um, it's a new work festival put on by the Portland Shakespeare Project. So I just came off of that, and uh, like crying in rehearsal and having to do scenes with my dad, where I'm like, "Why did you vote for Donald Trump?" and having having real conversations with people in in a fake life that I still need to have in real life. Um, so that is one thing, is, is the play is still looking for Tiger Lily. And then in November, I have my next show, Clown Down Failed to Mount. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> my other work is way more subdued and serious and personal, I mean, as, while still trying to be funny. But Clown Down Failed to Mount is me just doing a farce. And that's gonna be in November 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th at PNCA. And it's a show where Carla installs an Ikea cabinet. And it's during her new Mr. Rogers, like, kind of sitcom or whatever. And so she's on the first episode. She's installing the cabinet. She doesn't mount it to the wall, you guys. And it falls and crushes her. And so she spends the entire rest of the hour of the show singing and dancing and doing her monologues, but from underneath a cabinet. 
and there's talking pickles and possums and a woman named Mrs. Pancake. And, and I hope you come. It'll be a blast. So that's what's on the immediate horizon. Thanks for, thanks for asking that, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, everyone at the Portland Art Museum for allowing this to happen. Thank you, Portland Art Museum. Thank you, you and Moses Sawyer.